Welcome to the Friendship Sermon Podcast. Friendship exists to bring people to Jesus and to develop them into fully mature reproducing followers. Gather to worship with us Sundays at 9 or 1045 or visit us online at fcbc.church. This is verse 3 through 5. Then Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and satraps thought, sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. This is 19 through 23. Then, at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. You can be seen. Thank you, Samantha. Well, if you were with us last week... You know that Pastor Steve has been walking us through the book of Daniel, and you know that there was the vision that the king had and that Daniel interpreted for the king, and in that vision, there was this statue of, well, the head was gold, and then the chest was silver, and the the thighs were bronze, and the legs were iron, and then the feet were iron and clay, and so good old King Nebuchadnezzar, like most men, when he heard that he was the head of gold, well, let's see what he decided to do, and I'm going to just read to you Daniel chapter chapter 3. You can follow along in your Bibles, or you can just close your eyes and enjoy one of the best stories in all of Scripture. So King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, which is 90 feet tall, and it was 9 feet wide. And he set it up, and this phrase, set it up, he's going to constantly have to set up this idol because no idol has power in and of itself. It requires someone to set it up, and he did. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent together the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And by the way, whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace." Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans, these are the local yokels, they came forward and they maliciously accused the Jews. Anti-Semitism is not a new thing. It has always been around. And they declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace." There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. (laughs) And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, We have no need to answer you concerning this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace." Because the king's order was urgent, and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste, and he declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning, fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Our Father and our God, we come to you on this Father's Day grateful that you are our Father, grateful that you have adopted us into your family, grateful that you have made, apparently he's our brother, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. And we pray that today you would speak to us from this passage. We pray that you would guide our heart and guide our thoughts May we only swear allegiance to you. May we have the courage to stand strong. May we always keep our eyes on you as our ultimate authority. Would you guide our time together now? Would you only let me speak the words that you want me to speak? Would your Holy Spirit move in each of our hearts? Would you bring conviction as it is needed? And would you let us be a people that are purified and holy and just running hard after you because of what Jesus has done in our lives? And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're familiar with us, the last couple of weeks, we have been doing this uh, walk through the book of Daniel and really just talking about lessons in exile and what we can learn how, uh, how to follow Jesus even in difficult places. Normally, we follow what is called the liturgy here, which is a set of scriptures that many Christian churches will follow together. But every so often, I feel led to kind of take us aside into another area. And based on some of the stuff Pastor Steve shared with us last week, remember he had that slide with the three circles where he talked 
talked about how we used to be a very Christian country and Christian, Christianity was affirmed. Then we kind of went through a season where Christianity was neutral. And now we are increasingly finding Christianity to be antagonistic in our culture. I feel as your pastor, it is my responsibility to prepare you to live in an increasingly secular world, in an increasingly pagan world. And for that reason, we're walking our way through the book of Daniel, and then we'll look at Esther for a couple of weeks here later on in the summer, because they did the same thing. And if I can do this without sounding racist, we're Americans. We love our country. I love our country. I mean, I say a lot of stuff today that might make some of you question that, but I do. I very much love our country. You know that we are kind of in a race against China and Russia militarily, economically, sociologically, so on and so forth. I want you to imagine if China conquered the United States and captured all of our young people, took them to China, indoctrinated them in communism and so forth, and used their brain power and their educational abilities to raise up the Chinese empire. That is exactly what had happened to Daniel, okay? If I can anchor you very briefly, you guys know I'm a teacher. I want to anchor this whole thing for you. You're aware that the Bible begins with creation roughly 4,000 years before Jesus is born. Then we have the flood, okay? After the flood, God calls Abraham, and God tells Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Abraham's son is Isaac. Isaac's son is Jacob. Jacob's son is Joseph and the other 11 brothers. They then end up going down into Egypt in slavery for 400 years. Not a great plan for God's people. But God comes, and around the year 1400, Moses comes. God uses Moses to blast his people out of Egypt. He delivers them out through the Exodus, gives them the law, and then they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. They conquer the land under Joshua, and then they go into a 400-year bad season with the judges where they're up, down, all around, and things begin to fall apart. Finally, in the year 1000, David comes to the throne. David serves as king. David's son is Solomon. During this time, the temple is built. This is probably the highlight of the Old Testament. This is when the nation of Israel is the most Christian, the most godly, the most amazing. And then Solomon's son, Rehoboam, comes to the throne, and the very first thing he does is split the kingdom, and it all falls apart. This follows about 400 years of good kings, mostly bad kings. The prophets prophesy here, and then the northern kingdom in 722 gets taken away, in our minds, Americans taken away to China. In 586, the southern kingdom gets taken away. In this case, it's to Assyria and to Babylon. But again, to help you think about it, because we're like, who's nation of Israel? Who's Assyria? Who's Babylon? Imagine the China. Chinese, taking over our country, taking our best and brightest to China, indoctrinating them, like Steve said, with an MBA, a master's of Babylonian administration, or an MCA, a master's of communist administration and Chinese administration. That's the world that Daniel lives in. That being said, let's talk a little bit about the book. Again, I want to help you understand the book. Steve has already talked to us about the first chapter where Daniel's and his friends go to Babylon and their faithfulness with the food. Two things you need to know about Daniel. One is that it's written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Hebrew was the Jewish language. Let's say English for us. The first chapter and chapters 8 through 12 are written in Hebrew for the Jewish people. That's directed to them. The middle section of the book, the red part here, is written in Aramaic. Aramaic was the language of the world at the time, so Chinese in our example. And it was written to tell the entire world how God raises and lowers kings. The second thing, if you've been with us, what do you notice about the red part? It is a... Chiasm, of course it is. And so again, we've already seen Neb's dream of four kingdoms in a couple of weeks. We're going to see Daniel's dream of four kingdoms. Today, we're going to cover both chapters three and chapter six. They basically tell the same story, albeit separated by 70 years. And they share the story of what do you do when you live under a pagan king that is forcing you to worship a different God. So we're going to see how Daniel's friends are going to refuse to worship the idol. We're going to see how Daniel refuses to worship the king and how God delivers them both. These are the parallel points of the chiasm. Next week, we'll look at these two kings. Neb is actually humiliated and repents. Belshazzar does not, and he dies. It's a very fascinating story. Again, I share these things with you because I want you to know the Bible is not a book written by a bunch of random people and cobbled together over the years. The Bible is a brilliant piece of literature written by the Holy Spirit of God and in, in, intrinsically and amazingly tied together. And I always want you to leave these doors every week week, blown away at how awesome the Word of God is. If you were with us two weeks ago, you know that Pastor Steve introduced us to lesson number one from chapter one. Daniel and his friends determined not to defile themselves because they remembered God's plan. 
Yes, they had been taken away from their homeland. Yes, they were being Babylonianized. They were being uh, totally brainwashed with the, the teaching of the culture. And yet they determined they would not defile themselves because they knew that God had a plan and that God would be faithful to them. Last week, Pastor Steve taught us on chapter 2 with the kingdoms there that Daniel and his friends recognized God's sovereign grace by seeking him in community. You'll remember that when Daniel and his friends didn't know the dream, they came together to pray. By the way, friends, many of you were raised even years back. The further back you go, the more popular it was to go to church on Sunday. All good people went to church on Sunday. Nobody goes to church on Sunday anymore. I have found even just in my 20 years of pastoral ministry, used to, you can invite people to church. And if our church was better than their church, we stood a good chance to pick them up because everybody went to church. How many of you have invited a friend to church? And they were like, to what? Why would I do that on Sunday morning, right? That's when I mow my grass. That's when my kids are in sports. That's when I sleep in. Church is no longer expected. As our world becomes increasingly pagan, as it becomes increasingly antagonistic, this time on Sunday morning is going to be our only safe place. And we need to understand that we come here not to check our box and not to be good and religious people, but we come here because this is the place that after being persecuted, after being attacked, after being marginalized, after being ignored, this is our place that we are able to worship God and be safe together. And so I just want to let you know over the next 20 years, your Sunday morning is going to need to become a more sacred time. Your community groups, our growth groups that we encourage people to be a part of are going to be your only safe place. And it's going to be very important that you have those relationships because it is seeking God in community that enables us to survive these difficult times. The lesson that we're going to see today from Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 6 is that we need to recognize that our authority will determine our story or our narrative or the lens through which we view the world. Whatever your God is, whatever your authority, whatever your ultimate power is, determines how you interpret the world around you. And when you interpret the world around you, that in turn determines the actions that you take. Our actions come from how we view the world, which comes from who our God is. And I'm going to share a lot of illustrations that will probably offend you, but that's my responsibility as your pastor is to try to draw you through these things and apply this to our lives. Let me show this to you from the text. And I've abbreviated Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as SMA. All right, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered to an alternate authority. King Nebuchadnezzar commanded all peoples, all nations, all languages to bow down before an idol and worship the golden idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, Neb, we like you. You're a great guy, but we don't worship you. We worship God. We can't bow. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered to an alternate authority. Because they answered to an alternate authority, that gave them an alternate narrative or an alternate story through which they involved life. Nebuchadnezzar said, I am God. I will burn you to a crisp. I have my own crematorium. We're going to throw you in there. We're going to turn you into firewood. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they interpreted it differently. They said, actually, you're not in control. We serve a God who is able to deliver us from the fire. And even if he chooses to let us die in this fire, we will then live with him forever. It will not end our lives. Because remember, guys, we're eternal. That's why as Christians, we're not afraid of death. Because death is only a translation from this world to the next. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have a totally different interpretation. They're not afraid of the fiery furnace. Everyone else is terrified. The music plays and everybody falls. How many of you have seen in our culture how much the crowd mentality, something happens, and everybody goes for it? Buy a Stanley. Everybody buys Stanleys. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, new fashions come out. Suddenly everybody is on board. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have a different narrative because they are serving a different authority. That enables them to have these different practices, these different choices, this way of saying, we're sorry, king. We know that everyone else is worshiping the idol, but we won't do that. I want to give you a couple of illustrations because I've really been, I've had a couple weeks off and I've been wrestling with this passage and was up through the night trying to figure it out and just on my run this morning, it's very much burdening me because I've learned as a pastor 
that none of us in here think we worship idols. If I were to ask you, how many of you think you bowed down to the idols of the world this week? None of us would raise our hands. We all think we're good Jesus followers. But the reality is, is that our hearts are desperately wicked. And there is so much idolatry in our lives that we don't even realize. And so I want to try this morning to tease some things out. I'm going to go into a lot of, you guys know I'm generally pretty neutral, and I straight try to stay pretty neutral from the platform, but there's just a lot of things in our culture. I do feel that America is becoming much and more like Babylon, and so the references to Babylon and throughout Scripture are going to help us understand the world in which we live. That being said, let me share a story with you. About a month ago, I have no idea how this happened, but a friend of mine called and he said, hey, I'm going to the Situation Room at the White House tomorrow. Would you like to tag along? <laughs> I was like, like the Situation Room at the White House? And he was like, yes, the Situation Room at the White House. I think a member of his team was responsible. They recently completely tore the Situation Room all the way down to the dirt because it hadn't been remodeled since the 60s and they completely rebuilt it from scratch and it is absolutely top state of the art. And because one of his team members had done that, she was able to get a tour and he was taking a lot of his coworkers in because that's maybe some of the next steps for them. He was a really great leader, and he wanted to expose them to it. So I got to go into the Situation Room. I got to sit in that seat right there. Um, Somebody actually sat in the president's chair. It was a a pregnant member of the Air Force, and they were joking that maybe one day she'll be president. Who knows? I don't know. It was very cool to be in probably the most powerful room in the world for some of the biggest decisions, like awesome stuff. And they started giving us, obviously, a very unclassified briefing of what happens in the Situation Room and so on and so forth. And we know what they told us. Do you know what they do in the Situation Room? They watch Twitter. Kid you not. Because that's how they actually learn about mass shootings. Mass shootings generally will break on Twitter first. And so they have, I'm sure one of those CIA, NSA, some big agency has put together this massive algorithm that runs through all the tweets or the X's or whatever they are that you call them now, and it will let them and alert them if there is a mass shooting. You know what they also do in the Situation Room? They watch the Weather Channel. All right, And every other thing, because if there's a hurricane, a natural disaster, you're going to have FEMA and all the other government agencies there, and they're going to be doing that. Then they walked us down the hall, and they showed us very briefly this room. This is like the communications room or whatever. I forget what it's called. And this is where they monitor everything that's going on in the world. And like, I was like, man, this is so cool. You know what they were watching when we went in? Obviously, they couldn't show us the classified stuff. They were watching Burger King commercials right, on CNN. Because, and I've actually heard in the White House, the way the White House knows most news is breaking, is they watch the news, all right? And I began to realize this. The Situation Room is really cool. And I do think that we have a lot of very dedicated people that are working to bring the absolute best intelligence to the president and to all of his officials in order to be able to make the best decisions that they possibly can. And it was interesting listening to the people that worked there and how committed they were to that and so on and so forth. But whereas I walked in absolutely in awe and I walked in like, wow, this is really powerful, I walked out realizing that they don't know much. And here's what I mean by that, because when they were talking about having hurricanes up on the thing, obviously a hurricane can completely destroy an administration. Remember Bush and Katrina? All right? You understand that the Biden administration in an election year, if there is one bad shooting, if there is one bad you know, emergency disaster that they don't respond to, well, that can totally tip the election. So they are trying to get their hands on absolutely every bit of intel that they possibly can. And I was sitting there thinking, I know the God that makes the hurricanes. But when you operate from an atheistic perspective, the only hope you can have is the absolute best intel so that you can absolutely make the best response, or you can worship the God who created the whole thing, and obviously he's raised up governments to do that, and I am grateful for our government and for the things that it does, but at the end of the day, I don't need our government to do these things for us because I have a God that is over top of it all. Do you remember this picture? Very famous picture. This actually took place right across the hall, not in the Situation Room, but a tiny little room. This is when they took out bin Laden. And obviously, this is uh, back during President Obama's time. These are some of the most powerful people in the world. And this is an iconic picture because this was an iconic moment. And how much power did they actually have? None. Remember the wind knocked one of the helicopters down and they had to blow it up and so on and so forth. And obviously we have some of the best trained military and they pulled out and they accomplished the mission. But what could these people do about it? Watch it on TV. <laughs> That's it. Begin. They, have the, they think they have power, but they don't because we understand where the ultimate authority comes from. 
I know a lot of you are saying, preach it, Robert, that government, they don't know anything. But God bless me, I got a gun in my pocket, and that's how I protect myself. Right? Any of you in here? Like, I suspect in this room, I know we have quite a few. There's probably four or five guns in back pockets right now. Because you don't trust the government. You know who you trust? Yourself. Pastor Steve and I were talking this past week. Do you know what the idol of America is and the idol of Babylon? It is the idol of self. And you are determined to protect yourself because you have a gun. And you believe that because they have that gun, you can protect yourself. Let me ask you. The Bible says that every day was written for us before there was one of them. Whether you have a gun or don't have a gun, and I'm not opposed to it. If you want to carry a gun, carry a gun. But does that make you inherently safer than if you don't have one? Not at all. Because God is on the throne, and God has decided whether you'll die with a gun or die without a gun. Okay? I told you I was going to get you upset this morning, didn't I? Let's keep going. Where does money come from? Money comes from God. Well, the government prints it, yeah. (laughs) And they print more when they run out, right? All of our stuff we have, we claim, comes from God, right? So let me ask you this. How much of your money are you giving to God versus how much are you living on? Oh, you're going there, aren't you? I won't even mention tithing because I've had people absolutely pick fights with me over the 10%. Let's not pick 10%. Look at your budget and tell me where your money's going. If you are living on 100% or even 99, 98, 97%, if you need all of your money, in fact, most of us need more than our money because that's why we're drowning in debt, you are serving money. You have to buy a new car. You have to buy a new house. You have to take that vacation. You have to go out to eat. You have to buy that Starbucks. You have to buy that technology. You have to buy that new iPhone. Nothing wrong with buying any of it, but I'm telling you right now, if you are spending most of your money on yourself, you are your own God and you are worshiping an idol. And it's my job as your pastor to tell you that. Average household income in this county is over 100000 I understand many of you don't even come close to that. I also stand many of you blow that out of the water. Okay? And the point is this. If the number of families that call this church home were all giving 10% of their money, our church budget would be triple what it is. Now, I know you don't have to give it all here. And honestly, I mean, I I get in trouble because I say don't give it here. I don't care. Give it to Compassion. Give it to Missions. Give it to churches down the street. There's tons of great opportunities for it. But my gut tells me that two out of three of you are actually living on every penny that you have while you claim to be worshiping God while you buy more stuff for yourself. And you're like, oh, I'm glad I I wouldn't be like Shadrach, Michigan, many or I'd be like them. You know, I wouldn't worship the idol. No, you're spending every penny on yourself. You are worshiping Babylon. You are worshiping materialism. You have bought into the American dream. That's the whole American dream is buy, 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 so we can keep our economy running. Stop it. Serve the Lord God. Have I offended you yet? (laughs) Let's keep going. Let's talk about Sabbath. I get in trouble for this one, too. I've had people leave the church over this. But this is the one where I have to actually confess my own shortcomings. Our God calls us to work. In fact, in September, I've got a series on work. I'm really excited about it. I want to actually go out and video each of you at your workplaces and the ones that I'm allowed to get into and just kind of show where our people work because that's how you serve God most of the week. And it's really awesome and it's really cool. But God has called us also to take breaks and he has called us to take rest and he has called us to Sabbath. Because you see, the principle of Sabbath is that God is in control. And if I don't answer that email today, and if I don't return that phone call, and if I don't repair that broken piece of machinery, the world won't stop. That was one of the things they talked about the White House is it's a pressure cooker and it's an always on environment. And people that go there, they know they're doing important work and they know they're saving the world. And they work around the clock for the year or two that they're there at the White House and they punch their, tar- their ticket. And you know, that's how, you're, it's how you advance in the, in the, in the secular world. But we've already lost four presidents over the course of this country, and this country is still going right on, and that's the top person. Any one of those people that work at the White House could drop dead tomorrow, and things would go right on. This belief that we can't stop for a single day is a lie straight from Satan. And guys, I can preach at you, but I get caught up in the same thing. For me, Sabbath is Saturday, and again, I'm not trying to be legalistic with it. I know some of you work swing shifts. I know it's all over the place, but it's the principle of unplugging and resting. And on Saturday, I checked my email, which again, I tell you guys not to do on your day off, but I did it anyway. And 
this parking lot that we've been trying to build for five years, and it's supposedly in for the final permit. And I told them, I talked to the lady this past week. I said, you guys keep telling me this is the last thing, and then you find something else that needs to be done. Is this actually the last thing? She said, yeah, this is the last thing. Everything's good. Then she emails me Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock. Oh, by the way, it's not the last thing. You also owe $1,200 for a bicycle path, but you're not putting in a bicycle path. You're paying 40 cents an acre or 40 cents a square foot. And by paying $1,200, you don't have to put in the bicycle path. And so we need to check for $1,200 before we can process your grading application. I was like, wait, is it, you promised me you were going to do this months ago and you still don't do it. And the way our church finances are set up with all the checks and balances, it, it takes us two weeks to get a check cut because it all has to go through a system. And I'm like, great, that just delayed the parking lot two weeks. So I'm calling Todd Taylor. I'm like, I'm going to write a personal check for this. And then that way, you know, the church can reimburse me and that way we can fast forward this thing. And Paula comes out. She's like, it's our date. It's Sabbath day. What are you doing? I'm like, I'm building a parking lot because the church will fall apart if I don't get the parking lot built in two weeks. She's like, it's been five years, Robert. I don't think it really matters. <laughs> So I can preach at you, but I got convicted that I have my own idols. It's a parking lot. Isn't that a dumb idol? It's a really dumb idol. And your idol's dumb too. (laughs) We need to serve the living and true God. Okay? Remember COVID? I had people tell me, I saw noses at church on Sunday. I can't come back to church till the noses are covered. Okay? Because that's what the government said. Government said six feet. Fauci came out last week and said, oh, we just made that up. You know, it didn't really matter. Okay? So we can, and I'm not knocking that because then there's the other side of you. The government's telling us lies, blah, blah, blah. If you get the vaccine, you'll be infertile. Well, we've had lots of babies since the vaccine came out. Like, I'm sorry, that was a lie too. Um, It's all lies. The question is, who is God? And are we serving him? And obviously, I know some of you, God calls us to serve our government, and that is an appropriate thing. And as by and large, we should be serving our government. And God also told us to take care of our bodies, and by and large, we need to do that. So I understand the tension, but I'm helping you to understand that when these things go from, instead of being a tension, they go to the thing that controls us, we have missed the point. Are you following me? And again, I don't normally do these kind of things, but I just feel like it's applicable to pull this out as well. Oh, maybe we're going to skip that one. Maybe that was a God thing. We'll go back. (laughs) I've read differing opinions, some that say if President Trump doesn't get reelected, the world will end, he'll never, you know, America will fall apart, it'll never be the country that it once was. Guys, I've been in church a long time, and I've gotten so sick of Christians ever since I was a kid, back with the original Bush and Reagan, that's been the story every election. This is the most important election ever, and if this candidate doesn't, I've seen both parties in, and the country is still going. Now, the national debt's gone up under every single president, okay? The world has gotten worse under every single president. It's not going to change. I know other people that say, you know, if Trump does get elected, it'll all be the end of the world. It won't be the end of the world. Nothing will change because God is on his throne. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't vote, and I'm not saying we shouldn't vote for who we think is the best candidate and whatever that case may be. But I want you to understand this, that our authority determines our story, it determines our narrative, and that determines our action. If our authority is we have to keep Biden in there, or we have to get Trump elected, or we have to follow these COVID policies, or we have to ignore these COVID policies, or we have to carry guns, or we don't have to carry guns, or we have to have a good situation room and top-notch military to keep us all safe, if that is our authority, that determines our narrative and how we see the world. I am only safe if America has the best military. I am only safe if I can carry a gun. I am only safe if I wear a mask. I am only safe if I never get that vaccine in my body. I am only safe if I have money. Do you see this? We are taking this authority. This becomes our narrative and it drives our actions and we end up being like all the people that fell down and worshiped the idol. So I ask you these questions this morning. Who or what is your God or your authority? Is your God the Yahweh God Almighty or is it yourself? Is it power? Is it money? Is it family? Somebody said amen to family in the first service. What did Jesus say about family? If you're not willing to forsake your family, you're not worthy of me. Yes, God is generally called as fathers. Your job is to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Largely speaking, we are to defend and to protect our families. And I believe in taking certain appropriate steps to do that. But our families can become idols, and they are an idol, especially in American Christianity. You are called to serve God first not your family. So what is your narrative? How do you interpret, sorry, how do you interpret the world? What story do you read through? And then finally, how do you see what lens are you seeing things through? How does that determine your actions? And how do your actions make you different? 
And I would ask you this. When was the last time that someone recognized you were a Christian because of how you lived? At school, at work, somebody came to you and they said, I can tell that you live differently. What is different about you? Or do you so perfectly blend in that you're like everybody else, falling down and worshiping and following that through? I want to close by reading the last story that we're going to look at, the other half of this chiasm. This is from Daniel chapter 6. The teacher in me has put this up here. You can browse through it. Basically, I'm just trying to show you that the stories are the same. There is two key differences. In the first one, it's just certain Jews. and the second one, they are actually targeting Daniel. Sometimes we are going to be targeted simply because we stand out as Christians. Sometimes we actually will be individually, specifically targeted. The king within a furious rage in the first one, and in the Daniel story, the king actually works to save him. Sometimes your pagan boss will actually recognize your godly character and will try to defend you, but will get caught up in the larger system that they have to defend. Sometimes your pagan boss will actually stick it to you and try to put you down. But I want you to just kind of think this through as I close out with this story. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them, three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Do you have an excellent spirit? Is there something about you that demonstrates the Holy Spirit as it work in your life? It was so much so that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Could that be said of your work? Could that be said of you at school? Could that be said of your character? Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and they said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the counselors, the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any God or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions." Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunctions. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Daniel's about 80 years old here. And throughout his entire time in this pagan government, three times a day he has prayed. Do you pray boldly and publicly three times a day? Is prayer that important in your life? Then these men came by agreement, and they found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. And they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, Well, the thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and they said before the king, Daniel who's one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed." Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. 
My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, their wives, and before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Heavenly Father, may we too prosper because we have committed ourselves to you and to your authority in our lives. Would you give us the courage to stand strong when we are faced with idolatrous things, when we are faced with things that tower above, that attempt to tower above you? God, may we remain faithful through the passion and work of Jesus Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit you have given to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.